Well, another tremendous uh, Mary Eberstadt uh, presentation. Um, you know, there's uh, been a subtext um, uh, that's been going on throughout the entire uh, conference. Um, I think we've all known it because we're talking about the church's social teaching vis-a-vis uh, -vis human ecology, and that is religion does have an, an incredibly important social value. And what Mary is, is bringing out here is that Christianity has an incredibly important social value, which is simply being undermined. It worked. <laughs> oh, by uh, uh, simply being undermined by the, uh, the sexual revolution and its proponents. There was a wonderful study done by Kamita Dervik and 10 other authors in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 2004. And in it, what she shows uh, when she compares non-religiously affiliated people to religiously affiliated people is that religiously, uh, non-religiously affiliated people, when you take out all other considerations like stress or traumas or anything else that could cause difficulties, psychological difficulties, Non-religiously affiliated people have significantly higher suicide rates, suicide attempts, depression, despondency, meaning, feelings of meaninglessness, impulse aggressivity, substance abuse, and familial tensions. Significantly higher rates. Religion has a tremendous social value and as Mary pointed out, and also as Michael Novak and others have pointed out, Christianity has had a huge influence in, in public welfare, public health, public education, and of course, the, the redressing of slavery and so many other issues. This is a huge thing. The undermining of religion and the undermining, especially of the humanitarian efforts of religion, is another huge gash right into you know, the fabric of, of a proper and authentic human ecology. I think Mary has given us a real case and a real challenge to help us fight the good fight, a case that I think we can reasonably put before people who say, I'm not a phobe, I'm not a bigot, but you can be against religion and not be a hypocrite. Interesting. I think for all intents and purposes, we have a challenge here, a case to take into the, so, into the social and, and the community forum and the civil forum. And Mary, we're really, really grateful that you have given this to us today. We needed it. It's now uh, uh, another honor to uh, present our next uh, speaker. This is uh, Mr. Frank Hanna. Again, no stranger to this conference. Uh, Frank Hanna has been actually at uh, not only um, this CUA Napa conference uh, uh, since its beginning last year, but uh, at every single Napa Institute conference in Napa, California. He's been presenting talks and panels of various kinds, and it's just been so, uh, and of course sits on our board uh, at the uh, Napa Institute. Uh, additionally, though, a little background into, into Frank. Uh, who will be talking, you know, putting together the idea of, of virtue, prosperity, business, entrepreneurship. Um, uh, he owns Hanna uh, Capital, which is a, a company that invests in technology and financial uh, institutions. He's been incredibly successful at it. And because he's been incredibly successful at it and has appropriated the mind of the social encyclicals, he has uh, been a philanthropic leader uh, for the last 50 years. Uh, he uh, won the uh, William uh, Simon uh, Award uh, for Philanthropic Leadership uh, a few years ago. Uh, and in addition to that, I think uh, people have, may have seen this little uh, movie about the Bodmer uh, papyrus, uh, which Frank was able to procure. Uh, this is one of the oldest um, uh, manuscripts of the New Testament, which has the oldest version of the Our Father and the Gospel of Luke, and to present it uh, um, to um, uh, St. John Paul II. Uh, no, I'm sorry, to Pope Benedict. 
Uh, additionally, um, uh, Frank Hanna, you know, has been involved in education for many, many years. I think somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 years. Has started four different schools in Atlanta, among which are Holy uh, Spirit Prep and Holy Spirit uh, uh, College. So, um, no stranger to philanthropy, no stranger to the social encyclicals. Uh, we're really honored uh, once again to, to uh, have uh, Frank Hanna here with us. Thank you, Frank. Okay, so for just a second, since we had lunch, I want everybody just to reach and stretch for just a minute, okay? Because if we do that, we'll all, I don't want you to take a nap while I'm talking. So Mary was okay with that. I'm not okay with that. Um, why are we here? Well, presumably, we believe that in this modern world in which we find ourselves, that there are some shortcomings, and we've heard those shortcomings in a great uh, a description of, of them uh, throughout the day, particularly by Mary. Uh, but I think we believe that if we can analyze some of those shortcomings, that we might come up with an enhanced understanding that could lead to improvement within our society. Otherwise, we're just a talking club. And so I think that's what we want to do. And in fact, this idea of enhancing society by thinking more clearly about it isn't that indeed the whole purpose of Catholic social teaching? It's Catholic social teaching. Emphasis on the word social or how we interact with one another. Ecology is the branch of biology that deals with the relations of organisms to one another and to their physical surroundings. And so Catholic social teaching is, in a way, a synonym for human ecology. The human ecology being the branch of biology that deals with relationships between human organisms. Now, I was assigned this topic, what kinds of virtuous relationships lead to human prosperity. I'm not a professor, but a businessman, so my guess is I was given this topic in order to, in particular, address the prosperity part of the question. You know, prosperity is a state of flourishing. And we all know that human flourishing can only truly be a flourishing if it's indeed a spiritual flourishing. But even when we're speaking about our own Catholic social teaching, I think there's a constant temptation to get caught up in discussions and considerations of material prosperity. In all candor, there are a number of things that Pope Francis has said that puzzle me at times. And so what I do is I try to concentrate on what he says that gives me inspiration. And here are a few things I think he's telling us. First, I think he's telling us in his comments about capitalism and the markets that material prosperity is not the same thing as spiritual prosperity. And thus, material prosperity is not true human prosperity. And by the way, if that's true, and I believe it is, we need not look to the social teachings of the church and her various encyclicals as guides to producing material prosperity, but rather as guides to cultivating our spiritual prosperity. So as a businessman, I can give you examples of how building virtuous relationships with various folks with whom I've done business have led to material prosperity. But the honest truth is, uh, some of the more materially lucrative endeavors that I've had, they weren't relationships of vice, but I don't know that I really thought of them as relationships characterized by great virtue. They were relationships of integrity and respect and honesty, and I know those things are virtues, but my point is the relationships themselves were mostly transactional. And that kind of relationship, in fact, can produce material prosperity. But in a world that for the last century has become more materially prosperous for almost everyone in the world, almost continually for 100 years, with some exceptions for world wars, I don't think material prosperity is our biggest challenge. I think spiritual prosperity is. And as compared to the gains the world has made in material prosperity, many in our society not only have not gained in spiritual prosperity, but instead have lost it. So as a businessman, when I'm advising young people, I advise them that it is not a matter of which virtuous relationships lead to prosperity, but instead that only virtuous relationships 
will actually allow us to truly prosper. And not only that, it's only through relationships themselves that we are able as human beings to prosper and to flourish. In other words, I maintain that prosperity is a function of virtuous relationships. Now, there are two components here. First, one must have human relationships to prosper. And second, if those relationships are not virtuous, they won't lead to prosperity. So let's address the virtuous necessity first. Does this mean that we only have relationships with virtuous people? Well, of course not. I mean, we all know Christ dined with the sinners. And yet, his relationship with them, they may not have been virtuous, but his relationship with them was virtuous. If indeed only a virtuous relationship allows us to flourish or, flourish or prosper, how do we ensure that our relationships are virtuous if the other party's not virtuous? Well, our purpose for the relationship has to be virtuous. And how do we ensure our purpose is virtuous? We have to be seeking to bring to the other person that which is good for them, that which makes them more fully human and thus more virtuous. Stated another way, we must have purity of heart. Must then everything about every transaction in which we enter be noble? Well, ideally, yeah. You know, it may not always be evident on the surface. When I go into McDonald's and order a hamburger, and there, there doesn't appear to be a lot of virtue going on in, in what's taking place, but, you know, notice when you order at Chick-fil-A, which I don't know if you've, you've been to Chick-fil-A. Cardinal Turkson, I don't know if you've ever been to Chick-fil-A. They started down in my hometown of Atlanta. They're a deliberately Christian company. So when you order and thank them for, the, for your food, they respond as they hand you your food. They, re, they don't respond with, no problem. They respond with, my pleasure. They're indicating you, to you that the simple act of handing you a chicken sandwich is something that is good for them as they brought value to you. There's a trace of virtue there. In the commercial world, this effort to imbue virtue into our dealings with others does indeed promote our prosperity. The notion that we must be constantly seeking to provide value to others is indeed critically important in the world of commerce in which I operate. And there are business school studies that show that a focus on delivering value to customers and employees can indeed create material prosperity. Virtuous relationships create more humanity, not more humans, of course, but more humanity. They truly lead to human flourishing. So I want us to think about the degree to which we make the formation and cultivation of virtuous relationships part of our daily purpose. I also want to make two suggestions as to how we might do that and how we might encourage others to do it. But first, a procedural comment. I know it's fashionable for folks like us to bemoan the culture in which we find ourselves. There's indeed much that's dreadful and lamentable within it. But I actually think it's more important for us to, term, to determine how we might give better witness to that culture. Do you know why we lost the battle on gay marriage? We didn't have credibility. To get the world to listen to us and believe us as the community arguing for Judeo-Christian morality, we have to be believable. We have to be credible. What's the root of the word credible? Credo, to believe. What Kim Davis did, you know, the county clerk in Kentucky that denied the, the marriage license, what she did was notable, but she's been married four times to three different men. Where's the credible witness? If I were homosexual seeking to get married, would Kim Davis have the credibility to tell me about marriage? I don't mean any disrespect to her, but she didn't have credibility on this matter. And we, the church, not just the pope, not just bishops or priests, we laity in the church don't have credibility because as a whole, we're not living as we should. As a whole, we have almost, within our Christian communities, we have almost totally capitulated when it comes to heterosexual morality. The reason the Christian faith took hold within the Roman Empire is because of the strength of their witness. The two words that sum up why we're losing the battle for Western civiliz civilization today 
The two words that sum it up are Frank Hanna, because I'm not a strong enough witness, and neither are most of you. Because if we were, the world would start to change. So how can we give better witness? I think we can start with how we define prosperity for ourselves and for our families and for our communities. And as I said a few minutes ago, I want to provide two ways of doing that. First, I think we have to move from the mindset we have in a transactional economy to the mindset that we might have in an economy of the gift. A transactional relationship can be virtuous, but when I approach any endeavor as a transaction, I'm always weighing what I'm getting against what I'm exchanging. And that's not bad. In fact, it's good, but it has danger in it. And it leads us down the path of a transaction mentality. I'm afraid that our modern culture where we can buy so many things online without ever having any contact with another human being has led to more and more of our lives being consumed by mere transactions rather than human encounters. Now, I love the fact that I can order a book and get it online and I have it on my phone and I can read it on the plane. I, I like the convenience of having that happen, but I have to remember that the more of my life that is lived in that sort of transactional world, the less that is spent in human encounter that actually allows prosperity and flourishing. And particularly for those of us who have been blessed with education and other resources, we network and we accumulate human beings who we put on our contacts list with some sort of vague notion that the more transactions we might have, the more chance we might have for prosperity. And I'm not sure it works that way. At some point, I think the transactions that we amass, and particularly the, the kind of people in this room, we can amass so many transactions. I'm afraid that at some point it, it, it produces decreasing marginal returns on our prosperity. So my first main suggestion to all of us here is that we think about our relationships and how we can make them less transactional. Rather than transactional, I wonder if we might make them more Trinity-like. Imagine if I behave toward those I care about, like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit treat one another. I know that may sound extremely ambitious, even naive, but when we see human beings act heroically and in a sacrificial manner, that's essentially what they're doing. A mother is not rocking and singing to her child for an exchange. The relationship is Trinity-like. The second suggestion I have has to do with a reprioritization of our concerns. Am I concerned about our culture? You bet. Am I concerned about our political environment? You bet. But am I much more concerned about the state of the families I see in my neighborhood and my parish? You bet. And I actually think that of all the places where, to use a financier's term, which is what I am, of all the places where we might get the most leverage in teaching people how to be less transactional in their relationships and how to create virtuous relationships, I don't think there's a better place in the world for learning how to do that than marriage and the family. I'm frustrated because I think there have been so many issues swirling around this Holy Father that we've missed a leap motif of his entire pontificate. I believe he thinks that after faith in Jesus Christ, that the most important thing in society for human prosperity is the family. I'm not the first to recognize this critical role of the family, but I wanna, I wanna go just another degree deeper. I don't know if you've noticed how many homilies and talks the Pope has given since he became Pope on the family. How many times he's spoken about grandparents you know, just this last Sunday at the Angelus, he had grandparents handing out to the, to the audience uh, copies of the Gospel of Luke. He speaks to husbands, wives, children, grandparents, and parents in their roles as husbands, wives, children, grandparents, and parents. He convened a synod on what else? The family. As I prepared for this talk and I prayed about it, this idea of ecology and prosperity, I kept coming back to the topic on which Pope Francis seems fixated, the health of our families, the domestic church. If I'm advising students at a business school or any school for that matter, or non-students or anyone, I tell them the human relationship that is the greatest source of prosperity 
is a good marriage. Now, one reason we don't talk about marriages very much from the pulpit, in our schools, or in polite company is that we don't want to hurt anyone or cause anyone discomfort. And that caution is appropriate and charitable. I pray that I don't cause anybody any discomfort or offense today. But the unfortunate reality is that many people are not in a healthy marriage. And they're not to be condemned or judged or treated as anything other than our brothers and sisters in Christ. There may be folks in this room who find themselves in that situation. No doubt there are countless holy souls who are not married. And yet because we so rightfully are cautious about making anyone uncomfortable, we don't even talk about it. We don't even talk about aspiring to a healthy marriage as being the ideal way to have prosperity. Let me tell you the reaction I get when young men come to me. So I'm at the age my friends, their sons are graduating, and they say, hey, will you talk to him? He's going into a career in finance, yada, yada. So they come talk to me. I let them go on for 15 minutes about all their career plans, and, and it's great. It's great. Now, I encourage them. I say, that sounds great. I say, now, are you looking for a wife? Now, these are recent graduates. It is the, these are, I want you to understand, these are men whose families are Christian mass-attending parents, and it is the first time they have heard that question. Nobody's taught them how to be happily married. Their parents just assume that the children will figure it out. That's the word, that they'll figure it out. They default to the popular culture. And the young men end up seeing marriage as some sort of inevitable transaction that they'll have to one day enter into. But only after certain other transactions, like buying a house or paying off student loans, or sowing their wild oats, only after some other transactions have been taken care of. But just because marriage is really hard and the topic is sometimes uncomfortable and we want to be merciful toward those who've made mistakes, it doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about the ideal. Is there a chance that teaching our children how to be happily married is one of the most important things we could ever teach them? But do we teach them? I don't think we do. There's a temptation when someone, especially a believer, starts talking about these things for us to nod our heads in, in agreement as a critique against our modern culture. But I'm more interested in the critique about how we as educated Catholics and leaders in our own communities speak on this topic in our schools, in our parishes. We literally figure, they'll, we, we think to ourselves, they'll just figure it out. We spend more time in our schools on quadratic equations, and we don't spend that much time on those anymore. But we spend, we spend more time on quadratic equations than we do teaching them how to be happily married. Why did the Pope come to America for the world meeting of families? Because the family's falling apart. And civilizations break down without a bedrock of good families. All the social issues, crime, welfare, social pathologies, poverty, bad schools, the environment. None of those can be solved without good families. But you know what's interesting? In polite, in polite society, it's still okay to talk about how important the family is. What we're afraid to talk about is how important marriage is. We talk about it in opposition to gay marriage, but in some regards, gay unions, I, I think, are, are much less of an important issue than how healthy the marriages are within our own parishes. You know, the beginning of prudence is to see things as they really are, but of course, T.S. Eliot warned us that humankind can only bear so much reality, and so this stuff gets painful. But if indeed there can be no true prosperity without healthy families, and if those familiar relationships, particularly the marriages, are essential to prosperity, here's some questions I think we need to be asking ourselves, our community here, as we seek to enhance prosperity in society. First, why don't our fellow Catholics, including our own Catholic friends, know what the church teaches about marriage and the family? We're talking about college-educated, I'm talking about college-educated people who don't know it. And have we shared it with them? Why don't our priests talk to us more about family issues on Sundays? Why don't we pester our priests to do so? We lay people should take more responsibility for our parish. It's not all on Father. And you know why we have to do this explicitly? The culture used to do it implicitly, but the prevailing culture is now hostile. So we must become explicit about things that generation after generation took for granted. During the Synod in Rome, the Synod on the Family in Rome, one of the internal Vatican spokesmen said, 
that the term, quote, marriage catechumenate had been referenced at least 10 times one day. In other words, real training for what it is to be married. Why don't we do a good job of pre-cana preparation? By the way, this is also, this is not just father's responsibility. We're all members of parish. I'm sure he would welcome our, our help. This is a responsibility of all who are baptized. Father's not the one who's married. We're the ones married, and we want our children to be. And so much of the pre-cana stuff is terrible. Why don't we teach our children how to find a good spouse and how to be happy with them? That used to be one of the main jobs of parents. Now, I teased my wife because she took an interest in our daughter getting married. And one time, daughter broke up, and she was afraid he was going to go back with this guy. And so we're in Charleston, South Carolina, riding around with those guys who ride a bike. You know, and we hopped on. It's like a little taxi. You get on the back seat, and he <laughs> rides a bike. He's a nice, young, strapping man, and, and, and he's going to college. And, you know, she looks at me like, eh, you know. And, and, and I started teasing her, calling her Mrs. Bennett from Pride and Prejudice. You know, <laughs> Mrs. Bennett was always trying to set up. Exactly. I said, Sally, he's just, he's a, he's a kid riding a bike in Charleston. I don't know if he's the one. But the point is, she was, take, <laughs> she was taking an interest. Now we just leave it up to them and hope it works out. Seriously. I'm, I'm amazed. I'm flabbergasted. And how little time even faithful Catholics spend in honest conversations with their children about how to successfully get married. Why do so many of us worry more about what college they're going to than when they're going to get married and to who they're going to get married? One is much, much, much more important than the other. We spend a ton of time getting them prepared for college. What about marriage? You know what? They think we are more interested in what college they are getting into because that's what we pay more attention to. A prevailing message within our own community needs to be, if you're young and not married, get a strategy to do so. If you're unhappily married, make a strategy to improve it. And if you're happily married, talk about it. And if you've been happily married for a long time, tell those who are younger. We joke negatively about marriage. I'm not, I'm not privy to the girl talk, but I know men joke about it, okay? We're embarrassed to talk about how it really might be great. You know, I remind myself, we don't want to look weak. I remind myself of a resolution. I will not joke about how being married is difficult or a hassle. It's so easy to make those jokes or how tough my wife is. Marriage is a blessing. Griping about it is like griping about problems with your vacation home or your Ferrari, you know? <laughs> Just shut up already. It's not being a real man to make derogatory comments about my wife or my marriage. Plus, an impressionable mind might be listening. Even sometimes priests will even joke about how tough marriage is. That's okay. They want to relate to us, and I get it. They do that. But for every time you mention, how, jo even jokingly, how tough marriage is, every time that happens, there ought to be at least nine times we talk about what a blessing it can be. Let's teach our children and grandchildren that marriage can be the best investment in happiness that they'll ever make. I know marriage is hard. I know there's a lot of carnage in it. My own marriage has carnage. But what's the alternative? I'll tell you what the alternative is. Give up and have crummy families or no families. And that's what's happening in Europe and Japan. In Japan, not only do they not have children, that was step one, now they don't get married and at this point, a third of young people in Japan don't even have sex. They don't even have sex. I mean, it, it's total capitulation. That is not prosperity. Why do we think it's not our business to help others, including our siblings, our parents, our friends, and our children, with this issue? I'll tell you why it's our obligation. Because they're bleeding to death. Every one of us knows someone who has marital problems or problems because they're not married and should be. I used to feel like I shouldn't butt in, but I saw people I love ruining their lives and the lives of others. What kind of friend or family member are we being if we sit by while people are bleeding? Sometimes it helps, sometimes maybe not. One of the advantages of being older, I found, is you can butt in, and as long as you're kind of being kind, folks will sort of listen. Recently, a young man, I happened to be uh, paired with him. He was getting married on Saturday, and we were playing golf on Tuesday. And I'd never met him before, but the guy we were playing with. So I said, so you're getting ready for the marriage. You know, you make small talk. And he said, well, you know, it's not going to be that different. I mean, we've been living together for two years. And, and, and I realized he's given me the same thing he's told everybody for the last six months. So we walked on a little, a little further, and I said, you know, it's going to be a lot different. 
He said, well, what do you mean? I said, because you're making her a promise for the rest of your life. And she's making you a promise. If y'all stick with that promise, you need to ask God to be in it. I'm hoping that once you're married, it's going to be a lot better than what it is right now. A lot better. He looked at me. He, he was actually, you know, I was butting in. And I was an older guy, so he kind of let me talk. But <laughs> he'd never heard. So, so I wasn't sure, you know, I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe it was the wrong time to butt in. A month later, I get a, uh, I get a nice handwritten note from this young man. He said, you were right. It's better. He just couldn't imagine. Every single person he talked to about getting married had portrayed that marriage as if this was the inevitable thing that he now had to do at this stage of his life because the fun part of his life was over. <laughs> there was not a single person who told him he was going to actually be happier once he was married. We can all do this. We can treat it like a sacred blessing that we want to share, not some inevitable curse. And while we're at it, why don't we encourage our children to get married young? Do we know what it means if they wait until they're 30? Do you know how many sexual partners they're likely to have? When I mention this to my college-educated, mass-attending friends, you know what I often hear? I don't even want to know. That's what I hear. I don't want to know. That's not good enough. I don't want to know. Why don't we encourage them to start looking for a spouse as soon as they get to college? Will the odds of finding someone of similar intellect, age, and interest ever be as high as when they're in college? No. Why don't we explain that every marriage is a mistake and that that's okay? What do I mean by this? I read this great essay that Tolkien sent to his son when his son had just gotten married. And he said, let me tell you what the devil's going to do. He's going to start telling you, she may not have been just the right one. There may be someone else out there a little better. What if you didn't find the perfect one? And what he said to his son was, just assume you didn't find the perfect one, but that you found a really good one. Okay? <laughs> you know, I, I go to the airport all the time. I've lived in Atlanta all my life, right? I've studied those roads for over 40 years. The other day at the airport, I still made a mistake. I should have turned, yeah, I should have taken this route rather than this route around traffic. But I had to get to the airport. I never take the perfect way to the airport, but I usually get there. But every time I go, I make a mistake. Kids these days are paralyzed about making a marital mistake. The secret is, if the standard of a marriage is perfection, all marriages are mistakes. But grace blesses them. Why don't we teach them that living together before the marriage reduces the odds that their marriage will succeed? Do we think they know this? Do we know this? Based on our actions as a faith community in our parishes, we no longer believe it. In fact, an outside observer would say that based on the actions of the Christian community, Christians no longer believe that premarital sex is harmful based on what they seem to emphasize and pay attention to. Marriage and family are the most important elements of our human ecology. They're the best source of joy and happiness. And within our church, we spend hardly any energy, relatively speaking, preparing for it. I travel all over the country and outside of weddings, I don't ever hear a homily about the blessings of marriage and how marriages might be secured. I don't blame Father. I blame us for not encouraging Father to speak about these things and myself for not speaking about them enough. Pope Benedict said the two greatest apologies for the faith are her beauty and her witnesses, her saints. Pope Francis is asking us to view prosperity not as something that's material, but as something that is spiritual. And I think I'm becoming convinced that in the end, the world moves toward credible witness. In other words, the arc is bent toward the greatest gravitational force. Those of us in this room, starting with yours truly, have an obligation to be those witnesses. And at this point in history, I think we can most effectively serve that witness by asserting prosperity is not real if it does not lead to human flourishing. Such flourishing can only occur in virtuous relationships. We should all seek to have relationships that are less transactional and more donative more based on the notion of gift. That the best way to train ourselves, the best way to train ourselves for such relationships is through how we act within our own families. And that with the exception of our communion with the Lord, the relationships that are most likely to lead to the prosperity of society are healthy marriages. If we order our own lives toward these realities, we have a chance that society will take note and be persuaded by our witness. 
Right now, I'm not sure we have the credi credibility to lecture society, for we don't even teach it to ourselves in our own, our own communities. But we can if we decide to. Thank you very much. Thanks, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Frank, uh, with somebody of such uh, remarkable success, 